How about now? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all for coming here. Um, and it, before I start, I have to say that it is an absolute honor to be able to have a conversation today with Justin Cartwright and Peter Godwin. Um, as someone born in Africa, I am keenly interested and aware of what happens in that continent. And I, and I have to say that this is going to be um, a very interesting conversation for me. Also, speaking with people who have a different perspective um, from different countries, but also a little bit of a different perspective on what it means to be African. I also will um, hope that as we continue on this, in this conversation today, that we will move a little bit beyond Africa and really talk about um, what it means to be writers living in the world today with, with everything happening, um, not only in Africa with Mandela's passing or with Mugabe still in power, but what it means as human beings to live in a way that has some type of a consequence um, in the world that we exist in. So I think we have two people who can speak very well on that. I am pleased to introduce to you first um, Justin Cartwright, who has uh, been shortlisted for the Booker and is considered to be one of the finest novelists writing today. He was born in South Africa and currently resides in the UK in England. His novels include the Booker shortlisted In Every Face I Meet, the Whitbread novel award-winning um, novel Leading the Cheers, also the acclaimed White Lightning, which was shortlisted for the 2002, is it Whitbread or White Bread? Yeah. Whitbread <coughs> novel award, and um, The Promise of Happiness, selected for the Richard and Judy Book Club and winner of the 2005 Hawthorne Prize. I want to also mention that one of his latest novel is uh, called Lionheart and it is about the Crusades. So I hope that he will have some time to talk to us a little bit about that. Peter Godwin was born and raised in Africa in Zimbabwe. He is a journalist, has written two memoirs, but written also um, non-fiction books. Um, some of them involving Zimbabwe, but I think you've also done others, other countries, and we'll talk about that. He has studied law at Cambridge University and international relations at Oxford. He is an award-winning foreign correspondent, an author, a documentary maker. That is something both of them have in common that I hope they'll also speak about, their work in film and, and documentaries. And he's also a screenwriter. His latest book is The Fear. Robert Mugabe and the Martyrdom of Zimbabwe, which was selected by The New Yorker as a best book of 2011. Um, please join me in, in welcoming them here. Uh, I want to start off this, uh, this session by asking both of you a question of, I guess it pertains to the title of this, of this session. Both of you have lived in Africa in periods of intense, either intense upheaval or um, intense scrutiny of what it means to be white in Africa or what it means for an African nation to have white people who reside there and are citizens and, and count themselves as, Af as Africans came from a six-part series that the BBC presenter, David Dimbleby, um, did title the white, I believe he coined the term, the white tribes of Africa. Um, I'm wondering, in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, um, what has been the, his, the history of, of whites in those countries, and are they really tribes? Well, Would you I, call them can that? Can I answer that? Yeah. The, yeah. The, the interesting thing about the white tribe in question, the Afrikaners, was they arrived in Africa in 1652, and they developed their own language, and they're completely cut off from their origins. And they, d they believed, I think, that their, the, their problem, if you can call it a problem, was that they believed that they were ordained to march into this open country. And everything that black people did seemed to them to be a threat or negligible. And they never, ever truly in, uh, embraced the people they found there. The, their view was largely that anything they did was should be destroyed. 
and it culminated in, in 1913 with a massive land grab. This is long before apartheid officially was announced by the nationalist government. There was a massive land grab, and they took land and effectively turning the farmers into serfs. And they had no choice but to work on farms. So that, but the Afrikaner myth that they developed for themselves was they were a very special pe people, and they were chosen by God. And they used, I had an ancestor, by the way, uh, who, <coughs> who was murdered by the Zulu king, Dingan, and he was, he was on my mother's side. My mother's half Afrikaans, or was. And, and her, her, her great-great-grandfather was murdered in, uh, by Dingan. And this, but actually, the deal was a very dodgy one. And quite clearly, what, Ding, what my ancestor was hoping to do was to move in and take over, which is what had happened subsequently anyway. But uh, Mandela made a point that I only came across recently, just before he died, of writing a an obituary of him, and he said that the problem was in, in Africa, for the Africana anyway, and I suspect for white people as well in, in general, was that because they were frightened of the people they were meeting, they learned to hate them. And he made the very good point, I think, that if you are frightened of people, you, it's, it's, you have a vested interest in proving that there's something wrong about them, evil. And, that's, and it was sh shocking to me as a boy growing up in South Africa to see exactly how the police treated Africans who didn't have a pass, didn't have permission to be where they were, and who couldn't live where they wanted to live. Um, and I've never ever, in all those years before I left to live in England, I never once had the slightest sympathy for the government, which in a way was a good thing. You know, a lot of people, were, white people were kidding themselves that this was better, this was a stage of development for black people. All a self-serving myth, unfortunately. I mean, I think, I think that what, what also happened to some extent is when the first whites arrived in places like what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, it was very lightly populated and the, um, and the idea of land ownership didn't exist because people tended to farm in one place for a couple of years, three or four, and then when the soil was exhausted, they moved somewhere else. And so there was this, it was very easy for whites to sort of say, well, this isn't really just doesn't really belong to anybody as such. They were kind of, you know, went in and said, you know, well, we'll take this and we'll take that. And they, and, um, and the kind of mythology that, that, that followed from that. But, but, you know, we were talking about populations that were much, much smaller than they are today. So the, the human landscape looked, looked, um, looked a, a, a lot different to, to, to the way it does today. Well, that's interesting. And um, what was the, what, what do you think, Peter, was the, uh, was the image of, of South Africa for white Zimbabweans? Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's a bit like if you hear someone and you think they're you you think you call them Australian and they happen to be from New Zealand, they get very pissed off with you. They, and it's a little bit like that. It's like really that you know that, that it's a it's a sort of bigger country that's sort of like you, but actually nothing like you at all. But superficially, it's taken to be just like you. Um, and actually, you know, the, 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 there are similarities. I mean, but there are we so. <laughs> So we, we come from a long line of sergeants. That's interesting. Um, I'm wondering why did both of you um, leave your respective countries and to Zimbabwe and South Africa? And did you ever feel like you would return, or did you know when you left that that, that was it? Uh, well, I, I'm pretty well sure I wasn't coming back. And the funny thing is that I've since subsequently I've wondered how I could have abandoned my mother. I hardly saw her for 20 years before she died. And, it's been a great regret to me. I, mean, I did see her occasionally, but I'm thinking now that I have grandchildren, what it would be like never to see, see them again would be impossible for me. Right. But at the time, I was way too callous. But an odd thing really happened to me because I was brought up in a very English sort of school in Cape Town. When I got to university in England, to Oxford, I, it all seemed very familiar. And I fitted right in. It was, you know, chameleon tendencies is oh. one of the things I've always had. And I wrote a little book about my time in Oxford. It was perhaps over sentimental, but it was for me. I felt I really did feel that arriving, and I didn't have to talk about apartheid anymore. You know, every dinner party, every conversation you ever had in South Africa was just sort of completely self-serving and meaningless conversations about. And my a friend of mine called Franzel Slavit really was instrumental in easing the whole situation. He was the head of a of the Democratic Party, and he realised that this conversation between the Afrikaners.
and the ANC was never going to go anywhere. Neither side could win. And so he engineered this astonishing meeting of Africana acad academics. And there's an amazing moment where <coughs> an economics professor from, from Stellenbosch University and Afrikaans University then arrived in West Africa on this visit that Madame Mitterrand had effectively put in place. And there's a bit of film which I've seen where each of the ANC and the Afrikaners, the Afrikaners actually were greeted by naked women dancing at the airport. The look on their faces, I think, God, this is Africa. This is, you know, we're all going to be eaten. We're going to be put in the pot. Uh, but anyway, the, um, uh, this professor uh, stood up and he said, my name and he said, uh, he said, I'm a professor of economics at Stellenbosch University. And Tabo Mbeki stood up and he said, my name is Tabo Mbeki. I am an Afrikaner. And an Afrikaner is simply an African in Afrikaans. And this man had a fit. He was so overcome with joy that he had a fit and fell on the floor and had to be taken to hospital. <laughs> Um, and later, quite soon after, he joined the ANC. So it was a sort of Damascene moment. It's all gone a bit wrong since, but it, that was a moment of high expectation in South Africa. Um, I sort of, I mean, I kept leaving and going back. I, I, I after, when I finished uh, high school in what was then Rhodesia, the tradition for so-called liberal white families was to send your sons abroad to university and you, were, you could get out of conscription that way. And then the year that I finished school, they suddenly changed the law and I was conscripted and, did, you know, and had to serve time in the, in, in the war and um, kept applying to get out and they wouldn't let me out and they wouldn't let me out and they wouldn't let me out and I just sort of got deeper and deeper into this war that I didn't really believe in and I was 17. And then one day I got a message, a radio message, saying that they were finally going to release me. And so I think I, let, I, was, I was in an operational area on a, a sort of, on a, on a Wednesday. And the following Monday, I was in law lectures in Cambridge. And it was really my first time sort of in Europe. And I remember looking around Cambridge, and it was sort of in a, in a bride's head revisited mode where even the heterosexual men were going around on little bicycles with wicker glasses and long white scarves wafting along. And, and I was just trying to remember where I put my weapon the whole time. And so it, it was very strange. And then I realized very shortly afterwards that they tripled the foreign students' fees and my little scholarships, oh. carefully nurtured, weren't, weren't going to be enough. So I had to get a job. And um, in those days, if you were an English student, you didn't work, and you had, you had a grant, and you weren't allowed to have a student job, as far as I remember. And I got a job. I went to the job center and asked them um, what the highest paying job they had for someone with no qualifications was. <laughs> and so they pointed me to the sewage farm. That was one thing I could do. And they said, oh, I could, be, I could work in the local mental hospital called Fullbourne, where they needed someone to restrain the patients when they got violent and attacked the staff. And so I thought, well, I've just been in the Rhodesian army. I can do that. And I remember asking, I remember asking the woman at the job center. She said, you're not a student, are you? And I said, no, 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 I'm not a student. And, she, and, and so she said, you could have this job at Fullbourne. And, and I said to her, will I be armed? And she said, no, you won't be armed. It's just so, so I went and started working at this, at this mental hospital and, and, so I, and I was so ashamed that I would get the bus off the side and go to this little village, it was called Fullbourne, a few miles outside Cambridge. And, do, and um, after a while, I mean in days, the rest of the staff busted me and realized that I, wasn't, I was a student or whatever, but they let me stay. And they asked me what I was studying and I said law and they said, well we've got a professor here who has moments of kind of clarity. He would beep you when he's okay. So they would beep me and I would go because I realized I'm, I'm going to fail because I'm not going to. And, and so my first year at Cambridge, I was this professor was helping me with my studies. And I used to write these very florid essays that were basically he dictated, essentially. And then they, the, my professor would say, well, this is interesting. What, what are your sources? And I said, oh, many and varied. And, you know, so, <laughs> Justin, what, what was your first job once you um, got I, there? I, I um, went into advertising, uh -huh. to which I was incredibly well suited because it, I remember the first job I got was for a dog food to write a, a campaign. And I, I wrote it in about three minutes and I handed in this little short script. I mean, scripts were about half a page. I handed in, they said, look, don't don't hand in quite so quickly. Come back next Friday <laughs> and the game is up. And it, in fact, that was my first job and it won the so-called Lyon d'Or at Cannes. 
So that set me off on advertising, and from there I moved into trying to make documentaries and writing on the side. And gradually, I wrote a book called Interior nearly 30 years ago now, and that was my first proper literary novel. And what happened was I was so pleased to have it published and very well reviewed that I, it changed my life, actually. I mean, sometimes I talk to students who say that that's, if you can write and you enjoy it and you, you, you seem to be good, it's a terrific life. Yeah. And it has been, you know, it's been a, 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 ter a wonderful, in that sense, a wonderful life. But that's, I gradually slipped out of advertising, although I did political work for one of the parties, the Liberal Party. I used to make these party political broadcasts for them. Okay. I'm still quite close to the leader of the Liberal Party, but um, yeah, we, we tried to do something slightly different, and um, I don't think we necessarily succeeded. I met the Queen, by the way, this is my Queen moment, and she <laughs> said, and what are you here for? Uh, and I said, she said it rather dismissively, I have to say. I said, what are you here for? And I said, well, I it was for trying to help the leader of the Liberal Party, uh, Mr. David Steele, and she said, well, very well done anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and moved me on smartly. Um, Justin, I, I wanted to come back to something. Um, you've spoken about the autobiographical content of many of your books. I think um, it's something that you've mentioned in various interviews. And, um, yeah, you did. <laughs> and um, you've also said that writing, and I think you're quoting, there's something about uh, that John Updike said, that writing is about making the ordinary into the extraordinary. Yeah. I wondered if you could talk a little more. Yeah, about I mean, actually, my wife said to me that she, I came to a reading I did in London, and they said, I wish you'd stop talking about John Updike all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I did know John, not terribly well, but I knew him. I wrote the introduction to the Penguin, the new Penguin issue of his books, at his request. The only note he sent to me was very interesting. He said, I think it's great, lovely. It was an absolute sort of hagiography. Yeah. But anyway, he said, I'm, I'm very pleased. He said, but you described my father as a schoolmaster, and he wasn't a schoolmaster, so he didn't run the finances. He was a school teacher. It was very odd, isn't it? Because a schoolmaster, I thought, was you know, yeah. a school teacher, yeah. but in America, practically. Not. That's the only note I have, but I've chosen it. But what John said was that his task was to look at the ordinary and by close examination make it extraordinary and this is I think it's really what happened why he never won the Nobel that he dealt with the ordinary and the Nobel wants something more world shaking or issues that are of greater apparent importance to the world it is in their constitution as it happens people think it's just willfully Swedish it's not that at all it's actually, it is actually in their constitution you, so books and you know Doris Lessing I don't think anybody would describe Doris Lessing or indeed my, uh, Nadine Gordon as a better writer than John Updike, but they both had the Nobel and... Yeah. And, uh, and you think it was, uh, in part, his focus on, <coughs> on these smaller subjects, on, on the more of what, what we might say mundane, but... Yes, I mean, there is a sort of a tendency to think that big issues make better novels. Yeah. And there's no reason why a very small novel on very apparently small subjects can't uh, be a great novel. Hmm. And, you know, Jonathan Francis was talking earlier this morning about the 19th century novel, which was sort of family-based more often than not. And I think there's some truth in that, too, that uh, th there's an obligation on writers to write something very big, startling, yeah. Yeah. and th it's competitive. And I think Franzen was saying that this morning, that it's rather competitive writing now, and he was talking about his own relationships to other writers and how he's trying to trump them. <coughs> and um, but yes, yeah, so your question was about John, and yeah. John Updike, that was his most famous remark he ever made, and he decided that he, he went away from New York to live in the country, and he felt that had given him a terrific opportunity to understand America in a certain way. That's really interesting. Peter, um, you write memoir, you've done nonfiction, but you also write memoir, and um, I read somewhere that you um, you said you write memoir and you, you write in the first person because you don't want to tell other people's stories. Um, I find that very interesting, not, not because it's necessarily unusual, but that, that, that fear of, of trespassing other, in, uh, into other people's stories, you, you've stated it so bluntly. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. 
and what, what might have influenced that way of thinking? I mean, I've, I've ended up writing not one, not two, but actually three memoirs, which mm -hmm. does seem a little excessive, um, even to me. But, um, but, but the truth is that, that, you know, they're almost not memoirs. I mean, they're written, a, they're, they're written in the first person, and I have been, I find that that's the way, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of talk now about appropriation of narrative and who's, you know, the, whose story you're telling. And inevitably, I'm telling a story that, that you know, my memoirs are, are, about, are about Africa, about growing up in Africa, about what's happened recently in Zimbabwe in particular. And inevitably, a, a lot of the people I'm writing about aren't, you know, I'm not just writing exclusively the story about a few white people. I'm writing about a country I, I know well. But I'm not... I'm not, I don't own that story. So I'm just trying to say, this is me writing in the first person, this is what it looked to me. And, and you know, sometimes when I'm teaching, I just try and draw the distinction between memoir and autobiography, which might seem a little precious and difficult, but, but, uh, but I think there is a genuine difference. And I think that it's, to use a televisual uh, sort of metaphor image, it's um, that, that in an autobiography, you would be the reporter standing in front of the camera, filling the screen and saying, here I am, and you know, whatever, you, you, you want to fill the screen all the time. In a memoir, the camera's on your shoulder, and you're getting to point it where you want, and you're speaking into the, into the guide, you're giving the guide track and saying, you know, and you're, you're being very subjective about where you're pointing it and what you think of it, but you're not necessarily trying to jump in front of the lens all the time. And in fact, you know, um, the, the less you jump in front of the lens, the better, in, in a sense. Um, so that's what, and, and I think, you know, what, what you were saying earlier, I mean, I grew up in an Africa, like most of us, even if you live, if you grow up in extraordinary times, you, you pretty much don't recognize them as extraordinary because you don't have a term of reference. That's your only context. You grow up in place. But, you know, when I look, the further I got in time and place, and I'm, again and again, I'm struck by how many memoirs are written when people leave, either in time or place what they're writing about. And only then do they get the, the focal length, the distance, to really see what, what, what was there, and yeah. also to see perhaps how extraordinary it was on reflection. I mean, when I look back to the way I lived on the Mozambique border of Zimbabwe, when my mother was the only doctor for 2,000 square miles or whatever, running leper colonies and TB sanitarium and whatever, I realized just how extraordinary it was the further I got away from it. And also that that world had largely disappeared. And I kept sort of, I remember sort of waiting and thinking, I bet you people are going to be writing about that soon. And then nobody else said, well, bugger it, I will. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, I'm glad you brought up this sense of, um, you're talking about a, a kind of distance that, that you need in order to tell the types of stories that you suddenly realize are not just ordinary, but extraordinary. Um, and you mentioned in, in an interview once, uh, you used the term that you were bearing witness. Um, and this was, I think, in reference to the latest book, The Fear, that, or maybe it was The, the Crocodile. The, the Fear, uh, the, yeah. The, the Fear. Uh, but there's something about bearing witness that, that, and that term that almost requires you to stand back and watch. It, there's a distance implied in that that I think you're, you're, you're hooking into. Right, and it was also, I mean, the context in which I wrote it was that it had, it had always been a phrase that had made me feel slightly nauseous before, and that it, I thought that it was a sort of somewhat pompous thing. But in, in the fear in particular, in, that, in those circumstances, it was really an effort to describe my own sense of inutility, that I was watching things happen without any ability to change them or indeed to stop them, and then started to think, well, what the hell am I doing here anyway? What's the point? And then realizing that you're writing to sort of have it recorded. I mean, in the fear, I went to quite, um, uh, quite great lengths to be very specific in naming perpetrators all the way through, which is one of the reasons I'm not welcome back in Zimbabwe at the moment. But I just felt like you, you're writing for some kind of posterity to say, this, this happened to these people in this time and in this place. Uh, this brings me to um, Justin and something that I wanted to ask you about. The fact that your father um, was uh, working on the Rand Daily Mail, which was 
liberal, left-leaning, and um, he mentioned, uh, there's something you mentioned in reference to him, that, that you learned from him the sense that ideas have consequences. Yeah, I mean, I mean when, I, when I write, when I have interviewed in England or at some festival or other, they, they tend to ask if it's been helpful, because I also write about England a lot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I believe I have a wonderful interpretation of Cockney in I can do it on the page, although somebody said it's a bit like Dick Van Dyke, <laughs> which was very hurtful because I spent a lot of time working on it. But I do have a quite a close relation. I'm known for, as far as I've known at all, I'm known for having quite a good eye and ear for what goes on in England. Um, and I think that I think that what I what is in my writing that's missing in many of my English contemporaries is I do have a sense that the you know, ideas do have consequences, or actions also have consequences, because that happened in South Africa. You know, things happened very, it was much more brutal than the life lived in England. It was much more brutal, and the things that the government did had appalling effects. I mean, absolutely appalling effects, particularly on the black population, but also in turning the whites into, uh, so I felt it was diminishing of the whites too at the same time. There is a, a problem though at the moment though because as Peter said in his, in his third absolutely terrific book, that is implied that Mugabe is a complete and utter tyrant and is dragging the country into the mud. And in South Africa the president is less than half educated and extremely corrupt. And this isn't really the outcome that us, we liberals were looking for. You know, mm -hmm. certainly not. So I'm not licensed to speak about Zimbabwe. Although my uncle, I had an uncle living in Zimbabwe, who was still running a chess magazine when the war broke out. <laughs> it, it, it seemed it, I wasn't really on the ball, but I suppose you could have something. But um, yeah, I mean, that is, I've always had this feeling, and people ask me about uh, how I write. I, I just say, I think I always have an awareness that, as I say, that you quoted, yeah. that ideas and things can have consequences, which is. England is more bland in a way, you know. And, well, that's in, so. If how do you negotiate with with the blandness of England and the fact that you are striving towards something that that is more consequential? Um, I wouldn't really denigrate other writers by suggesting mine are more consequential. It's just a habit <laughs> I have, really. But um, although obviously quite a lot of them are. Uh, but um, um, no, the the. the the tr what's, just ask me the last part of your question again. Well, 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 um, how do you negotiate that? Yeah, I don't negotiate really. Okay. I don't, I don't see, I think you see life maybe in terms of sort of negotiations between groups. I'm not sure that's how I look at it really. I just sit down and do my best, you know, and, uh, and sit in the study for hours on end. Um, and then as, uh, I think it was Jack Kerouac who said, if you want to be a novelist, you have to r realize that you're going to be sort of sit on your ass all by yourself for thousands of hour, hours. And that's all I do, I do it the best way I can. But I also was very impressed by what Jonathan Franzen said this morning, I can't bear in my own terms cliche or, so I ca books that, as he was saying, he can't read a book, if there's even one cliche, as he opens it, he throws it away. And I sort of feel that as well, I feel that the novelist's job is a kind of clarity and I think that a great novelist uh, tend to but incrementally increase our understanding of the world. So obviously my background is South Africa, although I operate mainly in England. Um, and that is, will never leave me. Okay. And I'd like to ask both of you, um, the literary, the writers that have most impacted you. Peter? Um, the King James Bible. I mean, just... Old you know, Testament, I, uh, New Testament. Well, I mean, I, I grew up... At, educated by sort of terrible old Jesuits. Um, and <laughs> so I just remember, you know, I think that the sort of prosody and the musicality of, of, of that old, you know, the old church services and whatever, it's just, it becomes a kind of, without realizing that, that this is literature in any sense at the time, it becomes, it sort of enters into your bloodstream as a sort of as the, as the literary soundtrack of your youth, if you go to that kind of church school. And I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't particularly realized it, but, that, but I, I recognize it now in the way that I respond to other writing. It's just, a, I noticed it sort of relatively late on. Um, 
the, I know there's a bit of a campaign against elderly white writers, but I was, two of them are before you, but I, uh, I was very influenced by Saul Bellow. And not that I, uh, Saul Bellow is a mixture of being very funny and being quite intellectual, and, and I've striven in my modest way to try and do that at times, and I found it inspirational, and also the aforesaid John Updike. But I, I mean, I've been very influenced by Marilyn Robinson, who I really only came across a, f a couple of years ago, but I was a, a judge of some uh, Booker International. And I thought Marilyn Robinson is a perfect example of how you can take something small and turn it into something epic. That's great. Another thing that Jonathan Franzen was lauding this morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, uh, there's some stuff. Uh, the writers that influenced me early on were uh, writers um, uh, in a cry the beloved country was a very influential me because it seemed to put, it demonstrated to me at a very early age that novels and fiction could be as moving, and perhaps in South Africa's case, a lot more moving than non fiction or indeed than official statements. And in South Africa, if you want to know what's happened since apartheid, you wouldn't want to read anything the government ever issued. You'd want to read Nadine Gornemar and Andre Brink, and in my case, I think John Kutsir, especially. If we talk about white tribes, John could say in his most recent book said that he has a loyalty to the Afrikaners, even though he's left the country and announced really in, in disgrace that he was going to leave the country. But he, he says he only has a, 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 any kind of allegiance to Afrikaners, and only a small group of Afrikaners are that in the Karoo, which is the dry part of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And there's something magical there for him about this white tribe that we're talking about, or at least we're, we're partly talking about. And John Kutsir acknowledges that although he, he couldn't bear to stay on, and although he, it is, as I say, in disgrace, it was his goodbye note. Uh, but he has this strange allegiance to this tribe, and you, I don't think you can ever totally escape it, you know. However, however responsible, as he says in the book, however responsible my people were for atrocities and so on. And then one last thing, I, I won't bang on too long, but I went to the Truth Commission for the Times. Mm. I reported the Truth Commission for a, a week, and it was a shocking experience. But what was interesting about it was that the stories that came out, and the way it was handled by Bishop Tutu particularly, but the way it was handled was incredibly moving. It was as though the country was absolutely crying out for a kind of catharsis. You know, they, they, and they got it. Um, it was both the most harrowing week of my life and in some respects the most uplifting. There's a, there's a wonderful black Zimbabwean writer that I discovered when I was sort of starting to write called Dambudza Marichera, long dead I'm afraid, who, who is a sort of, you know, Zimbabwe's kind of Joyce, in a way, writes in such an extraordinary way. As a writer, when you read a book, you're, there are two kinds of books that you read. You, you respond in one of two ways, in my experience. If, if you read a book that's pretty good, but you think you could do it, you're kind of seeing it, you think, I could do that, I could do that, I could do that. And then you read other books that, that you can just relax into and not sort of be editing with half your brain because they're so good and the prose has such authority that you never think that that sentence and that paragraph could have been written in any other way. And it's a bit like, who was it, you know, some famous sculptor was asked how he, the trick, how he sculpted, and he said, it's very simple, I get a block of stone and then I take everything out that isn't the sculpture, you know, and that's, you sense that there's these, the, the, that prose has a certain authority and could only ever have been written in that way. Wonderful. So we are getting very close to our question and answer period, but I, there are two things I would like to um, ask you. Um, one of them is this year's um, parliamentary elections in South Africa will be the first time that uh, the voters who were born in 1994 will be able to vote now. So we have um, the passing away of, of Nelson Mandela, and uh, I'd like to ask you, what do you what do you imagine will be happening, not only with these voters, what, what might they do, but um, what might a post-Mandela South Africa now look like, or begin to look like? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it doesn't look good for the ANC in the next elections. that are undoubtedly going to lose the vote, although we don't know how many. But I think that there's a problem. I don't think you can have a country run by a, a person who really isn't at all educated. <laughs> 
I mean, he really struggled at the funeral to make, you know, to make, say anything sensible, even to read his own script. It's not his fault, he was head of security at the ANC, but the corruption is astonishing, and that booing at the, at the funeral was, was frightening, and he was humiliated by it. But the booing is for the sense that this group of the ANC have gone from the liberation to the exploiters themselves. And it's, I think this generation that you refer to is not happy about it. They, they're not that interested in the struggle. The ANC have a lot of trouble now getting young people to come and listen to them talking about the glorious struggle, which in effect wasn't quite such a glorious struggle. It was a stalemate which had yeah. to be broken in some way. So I don't think it's, I just don't understand uh, how you can, I don't think you can have a country run by somebody as corrupt as Jacob Zuma is. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I, I covered the last sort of four or five years of apartheid um, as, a, as a foreign correspondent. And I, it's very strange going back to South Africa now and, 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 and seeing what's, what's happened to it. And I, th you know, I, I think it's, 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 both, it's both expected and unexpected. And there is this, you know, there's this, this enormous disparities of wealth among the black communities, mm -hmm. which are kind of extraordinary as well. I think one of the things, are when, when, when Nelson Mandela died and there was a sort of huge outpouring, and discussion of his legacy, and I was sort of curious at the, I, I felt that there were two different um, responses, that to some extent the rest of the world, um, and whites in particular, feel an, a huge debt of, of gratitude to Mandela that he's not cross with us. Yeah. You know, it wasn't yeah. after all that had happened to him that he could do, and so in the same way that I felt that, you know, one of, one of Barack Obama's kind of great, um, you know, his ability to get voted in as president of America as a black man is that whites didn't feel that he was an angry black man. He was kind of, and yeah. they thought that they were so sort of relieved that. The, and 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 I think you know, when I looked at when I looked at Mandela's legacy I, and and what that means to black South Africans, though, I think it's maybe something slightly different. And looking forward, I mean, one of the to me one of the one of the incredible things he did, given I've covered Africa for a long time and. Almost every other founding father, from Kenyatta to Mugabe to you know, Mobutu to whatever, stays on and becomes president for life and becomes the big man. Well, if there was ever someone in a position to launch a cult, it was Nelson Mandela. I mean, and yet he stands down a bit like Washington after one term. And you know, and so whatever we think of the subsequent um, uh, presidents in South Africa, we are now on the fourth president, which in itself, is, as a Zimbabwean, yeah. is extraordinary. We've still got a 90-year-old yeah. guy sort of geriatrically wheezing his way through, you know. Yeah. Through. So, you know, we look down there and say, you know, at least it's still, it's still you know, the ANC in charge. But that is, that, that is one thing that's often overlooked in terms of, you know, what, what, what his legacy is to South Africa. Funny enough, 90 doesn't look quite so bad to me these days. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, I want to, can I ask a question to the audience? Yeah. Mind? I'm quite interested in this Booker Prize, which is now open oh, to yeah. Americans. Yeah. Did you know, did anybody know it was now open to Americans? I would have guessed that our ties with India, with South Africa, and many other things uh, might well be diluted. It's going to be worse. D does the audience agree? I mean, there may be three or four Americans in a row winning the book, and no Indians, no South Africans. Who thinks it's a good idea? I, I, oh, a good idea. <laughs> to open you? the Booker Prize. Or oh, OK. Oh, there's a few hands. You're in a minority of one in this huge audience. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks it's a really bad idea? Thank you very much. <laughs> to see you. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a, a little bit of a controversy I mean, since, since, since it happened. Um, I wish we could talk more about this. I really wish that, that there was more time to talk about Mugabe and, and where Zimbabwe is now. Um, Mugabe has a special guest in his country who yeah. is um, a former dictator of my country. Um, and, so and owns a re an and, Italian and restaurant in North Harare. Uh, the irony is just go. abounds there. <laughs> so, um, but I'd like to turn this over to you. And it's now time for some questions. And uh, we'll have answers. The so questions? Just raise your hand right really uh, where is it? Okay, yes, we're back there. Thank you. Um, hello, Peter, long time no see. It's Victor Malatin. Um, uh, I, I just wondered, um, 
either of you, maybe Justin in particular, um, w whether you were influenced by or had any thoughts about Herman Charles Bossman. I I'm sorry if you already raised this um, in the first 10 minutes that I, that I missed. Um, but he just, um, he was a sort of writer that I discovered when I lived in South Africa and no one was reading him at the time. But a few people said, oh, you've got to read this guy. And he just has this wonderfully sort of wry description of life in a particular place, in a particular time in South Africa. Uh, and I just wonder what you, and, and I just remember thinking that the way, the way that he wrote was just magnificently clear. Um, and I just wondered if either of you had sort of been influenced by him and, and whether you thought there were any new people of that kind, whether black or white or anything else, who, who might be coming up and writing the same kind of very particular fiction uh, in, in Southern Africa. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've read them. Uh, I think I've probably read the whole lot. But my publisher in South Africa, Jonathan Ball, <coughs> revived them, maybe after you left South or maybe after you left. He sort of revived them and reissued them. That sparked a new interest. They, they, they sell steadily, I think, is the, is the way to describe it. And there were, have been series of short stories on, of, his, of his stories on television. But yeah, I don't think it's hugely influential. But there is a kind of, as, like you, people have appreciated it. It was wonderfully well written and also describes a time and a place magnificently. But I don't think you could describe it as an overwhelming favorite in South Africa yet. But he's well known in, in, in print, thanks to Jonathan Ball. Another hand, yes. Would it be correct to say that uh, the process of colonization and transformation subsequently on self-rule or independence to South Africa, both of them have been unique in the history of, world, of the world. Because you take China and the Opium Wars, you take recent colonizations and decolonizations in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. You take the case of India, you take Americas. The general pattern has been that the colonizer either pushes out the exploited people, like the Americans have pushed the Indians back to the mountain bowls, or when people get tired of them, they throw them back into the sea or back to their own country. South Africa seems to be, and Rhodesia, seem to be the only countries where they have, the, the whites have settled down there for good and not for worse, I think. Do you think it's due to, uh, due to uh, the attractions of the place, the economic advantages? Is it due to Nelson Mandela or what? I mean, well, in Zimbabwe, there are very few whites left at all now. I mean, I would imagine there are probably 20,000, something like that. So they're not really, you know, I, I think that they don't really have cultural critical mass in any way. They increasingly, I think, sort of behave a bit like expatriates. I mean, you know, the, in fact, most people there, if you make money, you get it out of the country. So most people behave like expatriates. Um, I think, you know, it's different when you're dealing with a privileged, with the remnant of a privileged people. Um, these are people with resources. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm also, you know, I, I never, I felt that there was, I mean, Justin will probably disagree with me, I don't know, but I always felt, when I was growing up in Rhodesia, everybody, um, it, it, everybody was constantly telling me how different South Africa was to Rhodesia and how South Africa would last. It had many more whites, it had the Afrikaners who'd been there for generations, it was bigger, it was richer, etc. And yet, as I grew up, I realized that everything that happened in Rhodesia actually went on and happened in South Africa, including the end of majority rule, etc. And I've noticed now, I mean, that, that there has been, there's been a considerable um, white emigration from South Africa. And my, when I last looked, it's actually not, there's not a huge difference between Afrikaners and English speakers. Uh, the, the, the difference between Afrikaners and English speakers, it has to be said, is, is less and less clear as the generations go on. I mean, you've got, you've got many, many people who are both or sort of, you, you know, aren't one or the other. And, and I think in this increasingly globalized world, people's tolerance of any situation is dependent on their alternatives. 
and if you if you're well qualified or if your quali qualifications travel you you less your less tolerance of things going wrong in your own life wherever you are so a lot of south africans do leave and quite a lot of them go back too yeah i mean i think that's absolutely right the um, but there is a slight difference i think which is that the afrikaners were not colonizers they were simply a group who arrived in in south africa 200 300 years ago and they got you know they farmed and they did whatever they could and they developed the spirit which led to apartheid, sadly. But they weren't, they didn't have anywhere to go to. Holland wouldn't have wanted them back. You know, whereas in Mozambique and places, the Portuguese up sticks and went back to Portugal and other countries. So there is a sense of permanency about South Africa that might have been lacking. I think your point is well made. I think there's a permanency which still exists. A lot of South Africans, even one of the wealthiest tycoons in, in South Africa who I, I met describes himself as an African. And by which he doesn't mean he's changed color miraculously. He simply means that he's, he's committed to Africa and an African life. And he sees himself as an African, not a European, and a very influential person. That's quite common now. You hear white people saying, I'm an African. But, but the problem really is that there is this immense gulf in wealth. There's, uh, but it's, it, instead of the ANC closing it, they've exacerbated it. There's something like 10 or 12 billionaires in South Africa who formerly were ANC people. And that, ha that didn't happen through sheer merit. But yeah, there is a difference. Okay. Another question, and raise your hand very high, um, right there. there. Can you stand up? Thank you. Um, I would like to know, oh. both of you left the country of your origin. Sorry, uh, well, yeah, and there'll be someone else right after you. Go ahead. Um, at a certain point um, in your life. And I, was, I would like to know, within the years you have left outside of the country of your origin, has the perception of this respective country changed throughout the years and to what extent? I'm not sure I follow that entirely. Has, has, has our perspective of the country... We like the European perspective, be the European perspective or the American perspective of Zimbabwe or S South Africa, has that changed over the years? Yeah, I mean, the perspective of, on Zimbabwe has changed enormously. Uh, you know, the, Mugabe managed a strange thing in the sense that he, he took over in 1980, and the world was a very different place in 1980, as you know, that the Cold War was still going strong and apartheid was to, still existed. And in those early years, what, what, what happened was that uh, uh, the reason I think that a lot of African, um, uh, African dictators or authoritarians became such was that it was easy to do it during the Cold War when Africa was a kind of proxy battleground between Washington and Moscow. And you looked at people like Syed Barre, for example, in Somalia, who played Moscow against Washington, and you could, you know, and the, and the Americans were just as guilty of it as the Russians were, that as long as you said you were anti-communist and whatever, they would arm you and give you aid and whatever, and you could, you could do that. And for, for a long time after 1980, Mugabe was sort of untouchable as well because he was the chairman of the frontline states and he was kind of one of the, the main, you, you know, seen as one of the main cheerleaders against apartheid. So it was very easy if you criticized him and there was a lot to criticize. I mean, the, the Matabi land massacres that he, he presided over happened very early on in, in his presidency. They st started happening barely three years in and yet there was almost no, there was no international outcry at all. Um, and I think that, that you know, that, 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 that what's changed now is that n now it's almost common cause that Mugabe's a dictator, that he has a terrible human rights record and all that, and, and he's now become the kind of, you know, a, a slightly villainous figure internationally, and that's, that's you know, that, that tends to be a consensus. But it wasn't for, for a long, long time. Um, I don't know what you want to say about South Africa. The South Africa has definitely changed the better in some ways. I mean, it's a very relaxed and it's, it is a multiracial society. Johannesburg particularly. Cape Town's still a bit stuffy. It's a bit like the relationship between Melbourne and Sydney. But um, Cape Town is still slightly colonial in feel, but it was always less rigorous. Apartheid wasn't enforced there with anything like the rigor of the rest of the country. But yeah, it has changed, it's changed for the better. There's just these terrible fears about corruption and running the economy into the ground and, and the widening gap between the poor and the rich, which is, as I've said a long time ago, was never our intention. We never 
wished for that, but it's somehow come about. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, and there was someone here. Well, uh, my question is to Peter. You mentioned that when you wrote memoirs, that you felt a certain sense of inutility or helplessness, and that when you just point a camera to a situation and describe it, but you are at the same time, somewhere at the back of the mind, there is the sense that you are an agent of change, of bringing out a certain awareness. And I think in Southern Africa, writers particularly have played this role very actively, and also the white tribe. So maybe you'd tell us something about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very you conscious. I mean, if you're dealing with, you know, that my last book was, was written at a time when there were, you know, Mugabe was running torture camps and people were being, you know, terribly brutalized. And you feel slightly sort of pathetic if you say, you know, people's, you know pe people are talking to you about what they've just gone through. And they're talking to you in part because they're hoping that you'll do something about it, that you'll amplify their plight or whatever. And it, it, it seems that, you know, I say, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll take notes and then I'll go home and I'll sort of write several drafts. And in two, two years, if you're lucky, a book will come out. And, you know, I mean, so I just, I mean, and yet, I mean, I think that that is important. But I mean, at the time, your, you, my feeling of inutility is to do with, is to do with the scale of, of the timeline of, of all of this. And so, especially because, you know, I'm, I'm used to being a journalist or be, you know, trying to do it on a much quicker time. And I did write journalism as well at the time. But I think that there's a, a sense that you can't really help them in, in, the, in, you know, in the immediate future. There's not that much that you can do. Okay, um, very quickly, I, I wanted to ask each of you, maybe very, if, if you could be su as succinct as possible. Um, the Indian populations in South Africa and Zimbabwe, could you give us a, a very brief overview of that? Yeah, I mean, actually, the uh, a recent poll I saw showed that the, what, the Indian population of South Africa is the best educated sector of society. And the, uh, the ANC was, the strategists were, in good part, in, uh, Indians, uh, people of Indian mm -hmm. descent. And they played a very, very important role in the liberation of South Africa, and indeed commerce and many other aspects. I think, I mean, there's a small but very vibrant in Indian community in Zimbabwe. They tend to be, they're, they're, they're very well off. Um, they, uh, you know, I remember when, when Idi Amin threw, the, threw Asians out of Uganda in 72, I think it was, and, um, and there was a big, the, the right wing in Britain didn't want them, they didn't have right of abode in England. They had those British passports that you could just travel on, like Hong Kong Chinese had. And um, the right wing in Britain didn't want them allowed in, and then eventually they were allowed in, and there was a lot of fear that they would, that all these Ugandan Asians would come in. And I saw a recent poll that said that, that the Ugandan Asians who came at that time now have more millionaires per head of population than any other ethnic group in Britain, bar none.